Greetings, my name is John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. This morning we're going to be picking up in John chapter 2, verse 23. But before we do that, let's go ahead and bring everyone into the screen. There you see our, all of our pretty, smiling, hair-filled somewhat faces. We'd like to thank you for joining us today. If this is the first time that you've joined us for one of our studies, we want to thank you so much for your kind attention and your interest in spiritual matters. If you have joined us on our Facebook page, then use the comment section for this live video to drop in your thoughts, questions, uh, thoughts and questions you may have for us. If you are watching this on our YouTube channel, then you can use the chat area connected with this live video. You can also send us an email if you would like. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. Gentlemen, are y'all all doing well today? Doing all right? Okay. Let's okay. go ahead, jump into our... Bob, you're out in Macon, Georgia, right? Yes. How are things going out there? Pretty well, pretty well. I tried to rain a little bit yesterday, but uh, didn't get a whole lot. Getting a little yep. colder, getting a little cold again after several very warm days. Okay, very good, very good. Um, I lived for a number of years. Well, my parents were members of the uh, Lake, it's the Jonesboro Church of Christ, located in Jonesboro, Georgia on Lake Jodico Road and okay. attended there up until I went off to college and for a short time after that, before we moved away. So know the area well. I've All right, let's go been mm -hmm. creation, but I've seen it up. I've seen the signs for it up there, but I've never been there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, a lot changes in 30 some odd years. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and start with our study this morning. We're going to, for, for purposes of context, we're going to pick up in verse 13. We're going to read through the end of the chapter. And Paul, would you mind tackling that for us there? Be happy to read. Um, I think you probably have the New King James up there. I do. And what was the, <clears throat> the verse range? Let's start 13 and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. Okay, I can do that. Uh, let's read together uh, John chapter 2 and verse 13 beginning. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What signs do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and look at verse 23 through 25 just to kind of some additional thoughts there we didn't really get into last week did you so tell we me had, to begin at 23 or 13 john 13 okay okay yeah. I, I was just making sure i didn't mess up there okay no you did good the context kind of helps too yeah so here we have jesus is in jerusalem at the passover during the feast and talks about many believed in his names when they saw the signs which he did 
verse 24 though, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew, uh, knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man. What's the point there? What, what, what is John saying when he says, but Jesus did not commit himself to them? You know, it's kind of neat that uh, testimony is a big part of the book of John. Um, throughout the book of John, there's going to be seven things that are going to testify of Jesus. It'll be, we've already seen John the Baptist in chapter one. Um, <clears throat> the apostles are going to testify of Jesus. Jesus says in Acts in John 15, God the Father testifies on several occasions. Uh, the Holy Spirit testifies. The scriptures, John 5 verse 39, testify of Jesus. Uh, John 5.36 says miracles testify of Jesus. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. And Jesus actually will at one point testify of himself in John 8 verses 14 through 18. But man, there's no need for man to testify of Jesus. And there's no need for Jesus to testify of man because what man is, is evident. So it's kind of that neat play on that word testimony, I think. Okay. It kind of brings to mind there the discussion in, was it John 8, 5, and then verse 8, when one, he doesn't testify of himself, but yet then in verse eight, chapter 8, he does testify of himself, if I've got the right locations there. Um, any other thoughts on that? Is there a point here that, that Jesus knew that they believed, but didn't see a reason to, as uh, Brian pointed out there, to... Uh, receive their testimony or to acknowledge it or to in any way uh, bring it to light uh, and to testify of him. Uh, but he knew what was in their thoughts and in their minds without them even having to say it out loud. You know, I, do want yeah. to, I do want to mention this. Mm -hmm. Verse 13 that we looked at last week. That's the first Passover. In verse 23, this has got to be the same Passover. Yes. Because there are two other Passovers mentioned by John, and that would give us the three years. So this is that same Passover during which uh, he cleansed, cleansed the temple. And, uh, and so this is very early. Uh, before his ministry actually begins, because again, this period of time covered by John here, apparently, according to all the commentators I checked, comes in between Matthew 4, verse 12 and Matthew 4, verse 13. And uh, so here Jesus has been doing some signs that are not recorded. It does say plural signs. We don't know what they were. We only know the one that he committed, uh, performed at this time, the water to wine. But he was doing some other signs at this time, we just don't know what they, what they were. And, uh, but yeah, he did not commit himself. He did not tell them, uh, anything really about who he was. Uh, apparently no preaching at all during this period since his ministry, according to Matthew begins a year later. Uh, and in the Matthew even quotes, Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, as being fulfilled when Jesus returns to Galilee and begins his ministry. And so he's not yet really started his ministry yet. And so my, my mind is thinking that that's what he means by he did not commit himself to them. He didn't trust anybody with any information at all concerning who he was, what he was here for, uh, except that he had given them the figure uh, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And so, but that was in the future. He had not yet given that sign. He just told them he was going to give them that sign. The Legacy Standard Bible, Bob, says kind of the same wording that you said there. Verse 24, but Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. Whereas the New King James says he did not commit himself to them. Right. You know, a, a significant factor that you find continually in the Gospels, and I think it's tied to this, too, is it wasn't time. You know, I, I mean, you just got to you got to remember that with with everything. Jesus knew when the right time would be for everything that he was about to do and whatever he's dealing with here. What time for it? 
you know, so I mean, I, I think that ties in a little bit to this. Well, there were a couple times, and one of the most recent times, um, not most recent, we are currently um, studying through the Gospel of Matthew um, on Sunday evenings now. And um, what am I looking at here? Oh, verse 9. Sorry. So after the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and this is going to be, I'm assuming, farther along in the three years life of Jesus than where we currently are in our study of John. And it's a little bit different, but Tom, to what you said, after the Mount of Transfiguration, he says, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And there were events, earlier instances in Matthew where he would tell them not to tell anyone. And I think it was, um, I need to go back and look at my cross reference, a reference to um, Matthew references, was it Malachi? Maybe wrong about that, but in regards to the reason why he would tell them not to do this, um, because it wasn't time, basically. Going back to what you're saying there, Tom. And Brian, right. brought, go ahead. Brian pointed out last week, and I, and I had I was not aware of this that mm -hmm. four times in the Book of John, Jesus says, "My time or hour has not come." Yeah. And then three times, apparently, all those three times were during the last week, Brian. My time is come. And. Uh, and so it was all, it was, but he did begin at a, at, at some point during this period that his time was not come. Yeah. He did start preaching and, uh, the sermon on the Mount apparently was very early. Matter of fact, it was, it followed on the heels of his, uh, ministry in Galilee in, Mar in Matthew chapter five. And, uh, so very early in his ministry, he's got the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but even then, is he committing himself to them? Uh, or is he simply uh, giving them what they need to know, the truth? In general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? I've got a couple questions in the back of my mind, but um, I think we've already covered it yeah. sufficiently. Uh, just be reminded in verse 25, mm -hmm. the last statement there, he knew what was in man. You know, uh, yeah. uh, another another quality that, that's actually going to come out, uh, um, you know, uh, as he calls some of his disciples and so on. Yeah. You know, there is another place, too, that says Jesus did not many miracles there. And this was someplace in Galilee because they did not believe in him. So this could figure into that. He knew that he would be wasting time with a bunch of these people. That's a good comparison. Um, Matthew, when you're looking from 12, chapter, actually chapters 10 forward, but um, there are times, you're right, when Jesus doesn't because they would not receive him. Yeah. But then there were places where he, he criticizes them because like they, um, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, he said, had Sodom and Gomorrah seen the things that you had seen, they would have repented. Yeah. 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 All right. Any other thoughts on this chapter? How about you from home? Any other thoughts on the last part of chapter two before we get into chapter three? Of course, it'll take you a minute to respond because there's a little bit of delay here. But if you have a thought, be sure to drop it into the comment area on our uh, Facebook live stream or the chat area on our YouTube live stream, and then we will uh, bring it into our discussion. Notice we also have Jimmy Kersey with us and David Clark. We've got Andy Walter and others. Again, if this is your first time, take a minute and say, I'm Bob from Macon, Georgia, if you are Bob from Macon, Georgia, or wherever you're at. Just say hi and tell us where you're from. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and start now with chapter three. Bob, if you would, let's start with chapter three. In this particular discussion, um, we have an interesting conversation between Jesus and one of the Pharisees, possibly one of the Sanhedrin council. And there's it's kind of a lengthy section to this. So let's go ahead and look at kind of an introductory section. Let's read verses one through... Um, let's do one through six. It's not a 
great stopping point, but read one through six, and then we can look at that. All right, New King James Version here. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these things, uh, or do these signs that you do, unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Okay. Nicodemus, we see him crop up a total of three times, don't we, in the gospel accounts. Mm -hmm. This, this of course, is the first time. You only see him in John, and you only see him in John. Oh, good point. Only in, in John's gospel. On three, John 7 and John 21, I believe, or 20, whenever the resurrection takes place. Okay. John's yeah, 19, 19. 19. What's interesting about this is we this conversation we're having with him here, or Jesus is having with him, but then in chapter 7, doesn't he appear to come to the defense of Jesus of sorts? And they say, "What are 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 you one of are you one of his disciples as well? Are you from, are you from Galilee?" Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Interestingly, um, mm -hmm. they say, "Search and see, for no prophet comes out of Galilee." If they're talking about searching the Old Testament to see if there is supposed to be a, a prophet coming out of Galilee, they're wrong, because Isaiah nine verses one and two, which Matthew quotes as being fulfilled with the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and. Uh, so I, I don't know what else they could have meant by that uh, that would have applied to Jesus. That's a good point. Any other thoughts about Nicodemus? What role does he play at the end in John 19? He Which brings Moses. a large amount of spices uh, for the anointing of the body of Jesus. He seems to be a, this is just, I don't know exactly how to say it, a pretty decent guy. Uh, by what we see that that he raises up, as you said, sort of a defense about Jesus. Uh, he comes to Jesus, and you know he he's inquisitive. He wants to know. He and I, I don't think he's uh, being flippant with Jesus with his question. I think, you know, he says Jesus, says, you must be born again. And he says, well, what does that mean? You know, and and you know, I couldn't. I think he, he's sort of being. Uh, uh, what's the speech? Uh, well, yeah, he, he over the top, you know. Well, I couldn't crawl back into my mom and be born again. So uh, I think that uh, while many of the Jews uh, were afraid, and maybe he was afraid and, and deserves that that little bit of criticism, uh, he does a lot of really decent things. Uh, seems to be a person who's more fair-minded than what some of the others are. At least he yeah. seeks a private audience with Jesus. Yeah. And, and he seems to be truly inquisitive. And uh, mm -hmm. he is he is a man like most of the Jews of that day who are very materialistic in their in their mindset. They think that the kingdom of God is going to be a real kingdom, a political kingdom that to reign on it from Rome. Uh, you know, one thing, I, oh, uh, one thing I think is interesting too, uh, going back to this, he seems to be a decent man. You know, this, this little statement at the end in John 19 about him taking care of the body of Christ I, uh, and Joseph of Arimathea with him, we don't often appreciate that that's actually a pretty big deal. Um, that uh, th this idea is, they obviously don't think Jesus is a criminal that tricked him. You know, you don't you don't show great care for a body of somebody that you that you're thinking, oh, this guy is a great criminal. They clearly still believed in Jesus, and they were willing to defile themselves for the Passover. You're not supposed to touch a dead body, and, and yet they bring down a dead body and carry it off uh, to be buried, um, defiling themselves for the very Passover. That's pretty 
significant. So I think we're supposed to get a good feel, like like Paul said. We're supposed to get a sense that Nicodemus is one of the good guys. And I always like to use Nicodemus as an example and say, not all Pharisees are bad. You know, sometimes we paint a picture and say, yeah, all the Pharisees are terrible. Not all of them. There were some pretty decent Pharisees. So, Well, in, in the conversation here, the question, you'll see something similar in other instances, but they're doing it to trap Jesus. But this comes back to what you were saying. This was not, this seemed to be a very genuine question. Um, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. He says, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Right off the bat, a good understanding. But let's talk about Jesus' first reply. So what's interesting about these things, Jesus knows the hearts of man. So someone is asking a question in the first century. He knew their motives. He knew the directions. He knew everything like that. But he also knew the heart, okay? He knew the heart, and his answer oftentimes reflected that. His question, to Nic his answer to Nicodemus is interesting. He says, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why would he make this statement? Now, maybe this is too broad of a question, um, but why would Jesus make this statement in specific reference to kingdom of God? Thoughts on that? I think he knows. I think he knows who Nicodemus is. He 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 knows his hearts. He knows his thoughts. I I believe the statement is to provoke the discussion, to to lead the discussion in the direction that he wants it to go with Nicodemus. Like like I said, I, I had a phone call a moment ago when you all were discussing. I I don't know if you mentioned. I I've all I've always viewed Nicodemus as a secret disciple, if you will. You know, he was one of those not not ready for whatever reason to openly commit to him but it's clearly evident that he never opposed jesus or at least you know based on what's written about him and and so i think jesus is provoking him uh, he knows who he is he knows all men he knows their hearts and he's asking a question that's going to lead to this conversation calling okay. for a commit you know okay. if jesus if his intention and I think this is what the problem was with the Jews in general. They thought the Messiah, when he came, would simply restore the kingdom to its former uh, state as it was in the time of David and Solomon, and that it would be on earth, and it would be a kingdom for Jews only, and that their uh, physical birth into the nation of Israel would be sufficient. And so his... He is trying to help him to see that this is not going to be the case. You are not, you are not fit right now for the kingdom of God because you haven't been born again. Uh, and so it's it's more than just your natural birth into the uh, to the Jewish nation that is going to allow you to see the kingdom of God. You you can't see it yet. You, you're not there. Uh, not that it could be seen with the eyes, because Jesus later says you can't see it. Not with the eyes, but you can see it with the mind, with the heart. Uh, you can see it with the eyes of faith. And so that, to me, is what he's getting at here. Well, Bob, I think that's a great point. Oftentimes when we quote verse 3, we talk about being born again out of sin. Okay, we oftentimes look at it in that viewpoint. We're born of the word, we're born of the, the, the seed. We understand those things, but oftentimes it's being born again, we're putting death the old man of sin. But it's an interesting thought to think he was addressing or could be addressing the fact that they put so much heritage or emphasis on their birthright, being descendants of Abraham, and now he's telling them you must be born again, that even that's not sufficient. It's interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, and of course, the kingdom of God, he's been preaching. He, Nicodemus would have heard this. He's been preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. John was preaching it as well. This is what they were expecting to come. And you already touched on this too. Um, but um, you've got to be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. Okay. So then the question, understandably so, how can a man be born again? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? Reasonable question. So does this kind of suggest that this was really the first time? <clears throat> well, I say first time. This shows the difference between Jesus' teachings and the teachings of the Jews. 
this idea of having to be born again, and he's about he's going to talk about how that's done. This is new. This is part of that, that new covenant, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were just looking. Even the even the apostles seem to be looking for a kingdom that could be and should be defended by sword. Yeah. Because when they came to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, after he instituted the Lord's Supper, Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Malchus. And I'm sure he probably wasn't aiming for his ear, so he probably felt like he missed. Uh, but Jesus healed that and, uh, so that there would be no evidence that Peter had committed a crime, so there would be no reason to arrest him, uh, is my thinking there. Plus, Jesus was a compassionate man, and, and his compassion reached even to the uh, to the Gentiles and uh, and the and the servants there. But uh, yeah, he's he's trying to help Nicodemus see that it is, and he, as as he fights to teach his disciples throughout his ministry, it is not an earthly kingdom. It is an otherworldly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. And it takes a spiritual birth to enter into it. Okay, I've got a side question. I could take the time to look it up on my Bible program, but I have you guys here with me, so I don't have to look it up. Based on, Bob, you brought up the case in point of Peter uh, uh, cutting off Malchus's ear. Didn't Jesus, when he was finally before Pilate, say that my kingdom is not of his, of this world because if it's what if it was we would take up swords? That's John eighteen. John eighteen. Could it be? Now I'm just connecting dots that may not shouldn't be connected, but maybe Pilate heard, or knowing that Pilate might have heard of what Peter did, maybe that was a statement to further establish that point that. You know, what Peter did was not what needed to be done, and his people don't do that. It's just as all. Yeah. Blame it on Bob. He mentioned it, so it got the sidetrack going. So let's break down then verses five and six real quick. So he makes a statement here. <clears throat> Most surely said to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um Verse six explains the part that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, are we looking at when he says, and this is kind of a, a common thought among some in the denomination world, when he says, unless one is born of water, is he talking about the first birth when a person goes through when they're born into this world? No, no, can cannot be that. Because if it was, it, this goes back to what Bob was saying. Yeah. If, if, a, if a man has to be born of water, then it cannot be talking about the natural birth. True. Because a man has already had the natural birth. And so a man having already experienced the natural birth must be born of water and the spirit. Yeah. Years ago, um, I was in a, an online discussion with this fellow who claimed to be a, a big Calvinist. So much so he, he, he really followed in the footsteps of Augustine to the point of saying that if a baby reached out and grabbed its mother's necklace, that the baby would be guilty of covetousness when it pulled on the necklace there. But he even admitted in a conversation that when he says born of water is talking about baptism. You know, he, he just could not get away from the fact that based on what we going here, this verse going forward into the new Testament, we know the role that immersion the role that it plays in obedience to the gospel's call. And there's no way that you can't conclude that this is that immersion he's talking about here. Um, any thoughts about that? I think most, most uh, Calvinistic commentators agree that it's talking about water uh, uh, baptism. It's, it's the yeah. preachers that haven't really studied much that are saying that because that's their only defense against baptism. They can't admit it's baptism. Yeah. But Beasley Murray, I don't know if you're familiar with George Beasley Murray. Uh, he wrote the, uh, the, uh, world word commentary, uh, on the book of John. And he argues that it, it, that it's water baptism. 
And uh, as a matter of fact, he wrote a book about that itself, not just his commentary. And all the way through the book, you know, he's he's going through all the passages and showing it's water baptism, water baptism. But then at the end of the book, he says, does this mean you have to be baptized in water to be saved? And he said, no, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> well, uh, if that's what it means in John 3, 5, born of water and the spirit means baptized, then you've got to be baptized yeah. uh, to enter the kingdom. Barnes is basically the same thing there on, on that passage. Yeah. I have somewhere, I think I still have it. It's an old Baptist manual that essentially, if I remember rough wording of it, says at one time baptism was necessary to save, but now things are different. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, that's like early teens, you know, the 1900s. Um, but, but let's look at the other half of this now. I think the other half is just as important. Unless one is born of water and the spirit. So the first question is your translation, depending on the publishers, capitalizes that S. Is it the Holy Spirit, as is suggested here, the spirit of God, or is it one's own spirit? Well, you know, it's kind of neat that the Holy Spirit of God and water have had a connection going all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter one and verse two it introduces us to the Holy Spirit and we meet him hovering above water. Um, this connection, I think, is something that's uh, worth considering. Uh, of course, we move ahead in the scriptures. We go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. You're baptized. You receive the gift uh, from the Holy Spirit uh, that comes from the Holy Spirit. Uh, you go on to Titus chapter 3, and you have this conversation about baptism, you know, this washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So it seems to me that uh, we're probably talking about the Holy Spirit, not one's own spirit, but the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit brings us life. When we're baptized, we go from being dead to being alive. Um, there's a transformation that occurs uh, in that moment, and the Spirit of God uh, seems to be part of that process. We know that the Spirit brings life. Uh, Jesus will say that later in the book of John, John chapter 6. And it's important for, in fact, what's interesting is Jesus will go on to say, and the spirit, you know, my words are spirit. And then kind of neat, uh, whenever Peter mentions being born again in first Peter chapter one, he'll say we're born of the word, which, you know, Jesus will say in John chapter six is the spirit of God. So uh, we have a nice flow of connection there that always identifies the spirit as being the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's a good point. Good point. In verse... Uh, Six, mm -hmm. if we're ready to move to verse six, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, both are used, the Holy Spirit and the human spirit. That was born of the flesh, is flesh. My fleshly body was born of my mother's fleshly body. But that which is born of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, is spirit. And so that's that's the, the, the new birth there. It is a, a birth of the human spirit, a rebirth of the human spirit, but it is uh, accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And I think it doesn't take too much to, to understand uh, and to conclude that the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles uh, to go out and command baptism and through the word commands us to be baptized. And so when we are baptized in water, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, we are, in effect, born of water and the Spirit. It's not two births. Now, some people say, well, born of water, that's water baptism. Born of the Spirit, that's spirit baptism. No, there's just one birth, not two births. And it is a twofold birth instituted by the Holy Spirit, uh, but concluded by coming forth up out of the water. You know, Bob, with what you mentioned there, I kind of think about um, Paul's statement in um, it's be Ephesians 2. Yeah. Let me bring it up here for just a moment. Yep. Yep. Let me pop over there real quick. Think about what you, what Bob was talking about there in, in our spirit. Paul says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the courts of the world. He continues down to verse number five, even when we, God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together. Bob, this is not talking about um, our physical body being made alive. It's the spiritual man that he's talking about here. Yeah. Okay. Um, great point. Great point, Bob. Any other thoughts on this before we before we look at this next section? Just, just want to say that this implies that without the new birth, one's spirit is not right. It is dead. It is separated from God. And only through the yep. new birth can that spirit be reborn uh, through baptism in water in the name of Jesus Christ for their mission of sins. Your spirit is revived. It is, uh, it is in, effect, in effect, born again, just as your body has been born again, in effect, by coming up out of the water. And Paul mentions that in Romans 6, verse 4, raised to walk in newness of life. Why? Because our spirit has been reborn. Put to death that old man of sin. Yeah. Well, if you want a good definition of what death is, look at what life is. Okay. So you see a body. I'm going to pick an animal. You pick a dead animal. You see that dead animal on the road. How do you know that animal is dead? From an outward appearance, you compare it to an animal that's living. I know it's oversimplistic, okay, but there's no life in, in that body. It's hard for us, I think, to fully comprehend the idea of you who were once dead in trespasses and sins. How is our, our spiritual side dead? Well, look at what life is. Life is fellowship with God. Life is um, being cleansed of all of our past sins by the blood of the Lamb. But more, it is that fellowship with God, First John chapter 1. So when we talk about being dead in trespasses and sins, we're talking about being completely severed from God, separated from God really is a better term, I guess, not in fellowship with him. And that is considered darkness. If someone walk, someone says he has fellowship with God and walks in darkness, he lies and the truth is not in him. And so this idea of being born of the spirit goes back to what, what Bob was talking about. They're made alive through Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. Any thoughts? All right, now notice that you're being awfully quiet, okay? I'm talking, talking to you right there. So if you have any thoughts or comments, feel free to share them with us. Um, I think I popped, I popped up a while ago. You can email us at questions at truthfactorlive.com or let us hear from you in our chat on our YouTube channel or in the comment section on our Facebook page. Yeah, you know, wow. Brian Haynes, whoever he is, has been making some comments in the YouTube page, but we ought to just disregard him. So, Yeah, I thought about sharing it, but, you know, if he doesn't feel like it needs to be stated verbally out loud, I'm not going to share it. Yeah, <laughs> It'd be silly for me to read his comments when he's right here. Uh, yeah, right. Now, I, I, he's basically clarifying some things about the sevens and that kind of stuff, so... So, so yeah. go to the comments. If you're, if you're on YouTube, go to the comments and read them. That's the point. All right. That's right. Okay. Let's start now with verse number seven. All right. Where we, again, we're in the middle of the context. Sorry about that, but let's start number seven and let's read. <clears throat> Brian, let's go ahead and read down to verse 17. Yeah. Seven Thank 17. you for uh, that. And uh, we'll do reading, of course, from the New King James. Uh, 7 through 17, you said, to be clear. Yeah. Yep. All right. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus had answered and said to him, are, are you a teacher of Israel? And you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we've seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay. All right. 
Let's go back to verse number seven there. What about verse number eight? Brian, since you read that, you so yeah, well, yeah. you read that. I, Let's talk about verse eight I for a moment. Think, yeah, I think verses seven, eight, nine, and 10 might kind of nicely fit together, I think. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to be careful to say, I think there could be a different way of looking at this, but it seems as though Jesus is saying something specific that that uh, when he talks about this idea that the wind blows, and by the way, wind and breath, uh, these words are interesting because both in Hebrew and in Greek, they're the same word as spirit. In Hebrew, the word is rash, and it means to breathe or to the wind, uh, and it also means spirit. And then in Greek, the word pneuma uh, is that. Uh, by the way, even in our language, spirit is connected to the word respiration, to breathe. So even in our language, we have some of that connection too. Um, but he but he throws this out there. The wind blows where it goes. Uh, you know, the, the wind moves things, and you don't even see it happening. That's how the Spirit of God works. You, you don't see it, but you see the impact of it, you might say. Now, Nicodemus says, what? How How is that? How does that work? And I think verse 10 kind of helps me to clue in that maybe he's talking about something specific here. Because he says, you know, you're a teacher of Israel, and and you don't know what I'm talking about? How, how are you going to figure out the spiritual things if you can't, you know, I'm paraphrasing. How do you figure out the spiritual things if you don't understand? I'm just giving you a plain example. So I get to thinking about this, and I think, well, what would, why would a, um, why would a teacher of Israel supposed to know what Jesus is talking about. And it occurs to me that uh, maybe the idea of being born again was meant to trigger an image back in the Old Testament. You know, uh, if I were to ask you guys, when was the nation of Israel born? What kind of answers would you give? Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, rather than ask, I'll just, I'll throw you the answers. I think you'd <laughs> probably say, well, Brian, they went to Egypt. And then when they came out of Egypt, you know, that's when the nation was born. And I, and I, I, I at least I hope that's what you guys would say. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably right. Specifically, though, there was a moment where they were born of water in the spirit. You know, when they passed through the Red Sea uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul points to that moment as a baptism into Moses. So Israel was born of water in the spirit. And at that time, the wind came in and parted the water and Israel passes through that water. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's almost like, you know, a birth canal. I mean, they, they pass through it and they come on the land and their enemies are lost behind them and they're free. They're no longer attached to Egypt. They're now separated from Egypt. Egypt is washed away with that baptism. And so I think that what Jesus is suggesting to this teacher of Israel is that Israel was once born of water and spirit. And that that was meant to kind of trigger in him an image of saying, you know, uh, Israel was born of the water and the spirit whenever the, the spirit parted the water and, you know, we, we passed through it. And OK, so we're going to be born in such a way, you know. And so I think that that's really a big part of the substance here that he's meant to say. And like I said, I, there might be other ways people might look at these statements, but I think that that's probably the best, especially since Paul comes back to it in First Corinthians 10 to use it as a type for our salvation. That's a good comparison, connection with that. Any any thoughts? There might also be a, an allusion to the Valley of Dry Bones in the book of Ezekiel. Israel was dead, but in that, in that vision that Ezekiel had, they would be born again. Uh, water doesn't come in there, but uh, Israel did need a new birth and it continued to need a new birth and even at the time of jesus and 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 uh, nicodemus it needs a new birth uh the problem is it can't be done nationally it has to be done individually and each individual must come back to god through this new birth birth of water and spirit okay well, let's come back to the question now for just a moment. I'll pop it back up on the screen again. The question is, um, how can these things be? And Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? He doesn't answer the question yet. Think about it. How can these things be? What he does here, beginning there in verse number 10 or walks forward, he basically says, we speak what we know, but you're not hearing us. All right, I've told you earthly things. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? 
And then he says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And then he talks about Jesus then being lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Is that the answer to the question? How can these things be? Or did I miss something in the course of that text there, verses 15 and 16? I think you're right. That's what would make it possible. But then he also says, uh, uh, talks about believing down there. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, that's the, the new birth itself. When you come first come to believe uh, in, in that context, they would yeah. have a, a new birth in a sense of being uh made aware of the spiritual nature of the kingdom, but that is not born of water. That would just be uh, coming to terms with what Jesus is talking about. But uh, after the after the Pentecost, of course, this being born again uh, would involve uh, water in the spirit. Even then, I think people have to have been experiencing a new birth of sorts when they were baptized by John and by Jesus disciples during this period, but it did not put them in the kingdom because the kingdom had not yet been established. And, uh, so I think you're, you're right. The, uh, Jesus had to be lifted up in order for this to be made possible. And so everything that was accomplished by John, was only accomplished provisionally uh, upon the provision that would be made by God and Jesus when Jesus died on the cross. Well, and you think about it, you, like what you said, verse 15 or verse 14, he must be lifted up. And they're talking about believing in him after he's lifted up. Even verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's, that's a look forward to the death of Christ. You know, and so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That belief is on in Jesus on the other side of the cross. Not That's saying right. that they shouldn't believe now, but this is what he's looking forward to. And he's doing this. He will be lifted up so that he might save the world, according to verse 17 there. Um, and we'll look at verse 18 here in a minute once, once we get to that section. We've got a couple comments that have popped in. So let me go ahead and bring the first one up. This comes in from Caleb Davis. Caleb says, ignorance is not an excuse. Every man can see God's glory in the world we live in. Paul addresses this in Romans 1, 18 through 20. It's a good point. Very good point. And then David Clark, he says, Jesus doesn't instantly answer our questions. He wants us to think before we answer. It's an interesting point. I mean, that's why we have to study the scriptures and diligently with perseverance study them. Appreciate that, gentlemen. All right. Any other thoughts on this before we continue um, in context? Brian? I do think that the bronze snake is such a neat image. Um, Jesus says, you know, basically he says, hey, I'm the bronze snake. Um, and, I, and I've always thought, well, what do you mean by that, Jesus? How, how is Jesus the bronze snake? Well, when the bronze snake is manufactured, you go back to the book of Numbers. In Numbers 21, you'd read that story. What you find is that Israel is plagued by snakes you know, and fiery snakes. So, so Moses makes something that's an image of the thing that's afflicting them. Uh, Jesus is going to die in the flesh. And you might say it's kind of like he's an image of the thing that afflicts us. So what, what afflicts me? The flesh. You know, the, you know, Romans chapter eight talks about Jesus coming in the form of sinful flesh. You know, my problems tend to be my worldliness uh, that appeals to me through my flesh. Jesus is going to die in the flesh. He's going to die like like the fiery serpent is hung up, he's going to be in the image of the very thing that afflicts me. And that turning to that thing is going to do it. There's three times in the book of John where there's going to be this unusual reference about God drawing men. And he'll say in John chapter 6, God's going to draw them in. And then in John chapter 12, he's going to say, God's going to draw them in by lifting me up. And now we have here in John 3, this lifting me up is the thing that's going to bring, is going to manifest my love. So it's kind of neat to understand the connection of those three passages to see this Old Testament moment and why that moment actually was a foreshadow of the things that were going to come. I think it's a good point. Good point. One other thing, mm -hmm. 
you know, and I know we've all experienced this. We've heard it all of our preaching lives and uh, how the people in the denominational world will use verse 16 here to show it's just believing. But you've got to take that in the context of John 3, 5. Uh, believing here is a uh, is metonymy for the new birth of water in the spirit. It's a part of it, but it's not the entirety of it. And if a person doesn't believe, he cannot experience the new birth. Uh, if a person does believe, he may still need to experience the new birth. Uh, and so in, in verse 16, he's talking about belief as having, uh, belief having led one to experience the new birth, uh, to be born of water in the spirit. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not remembering the passage. Anyway, there's another passage that uses something similar terminology as verse number five. I'm talking about the sprinkling of, um, what is it? I have to look it up later. Um, but one more thing, cause we're almost out of time. As far as this next section, we want to hold off till next time. But people talk about, like you said, Bob, John three, verse 16 there and the focus on belief. When we get verse 18, he's really going to talk about what unbelief actually is and the condemnation and why people choose not to believe. And I'd suggest that. Another reason why you can't simply say that, well, I believe that Jesus is the son of God and believe that you're saved. There's so much more that defines that true conviction, that persuasion, that when we look at the rest of this, you'll understand why a lot of people may say, not you, but we'll understand why a lot of people may say they believe in Jesus, but they will be lost. Um, but okay. Any thoughts or comments about that? In John chapter eight, there's a neat uh, little bit about, it'll say the Jews that believed in Jesus came to him. At the end of that chapter, those same Jews are picking up stones to stone him. It's not just believing, you know. Uh, there were people that believed Jesus, the one to kill him. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, John is not saying it's just belief. I want to go back to verse seven just for a moment here, uh, when Jesus said, "Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again." Uh, I think we need to understand that sometimes truth is implied. And a lot of people don't understand, even brethren do not understand necessary inference and implication. Now, Jesus did not say, quote, you must be born again. But when he said, except the man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That was in essence saying you must be born again. And so I, th I think a lot of times people say, well, it doesn't say that. Well, it doesn't say that specifically. It doesn't say that explicitly, but it says that implicitly. Belief and believe and be baptized. Uh, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. You, you must be baptized. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins. You must be baptized. Uh, and so every time baptism is commanded, it is implied that you must be baptized. And yeah. so... Uh, I think that is something that people need to consider. All right. Two quick things, and we've got to pull it to a close. We're uh, right about five minutes left in our hour here. Um, the passage I was thinking about was Hebrews 10, 22, when he says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our water bodies washed with pure water. Oftentimes I think about John 3, 6, when I read this passage, there may not be a direct connection between the two, but it is very similar. And the end result after one is, um, well, once they are saved by the blood of the lamb. But Caleb says, and bringing his comment here real quick, Caleb says, belief that draws you to action like the Israelites had to go look at the snake, we have to go to the cross as represented in our death and burial and baptism, like uh, connecting that with what Brian was saying earlier. And then Aline, she says, Jesus allusion to physical birth, Water and breath should also remind one um, that blood is present in the physical birth. The blood of Christ washes away our sins in baptism. Good point. Good point. And the other two comments are by Brian, so I won't bother breaking those in. <laughs>
You know, what's, what's really unfair, Brian, is that if you're only sharing these with YouTube, the people on Facebook, they're missing out. You're depriving them of your wonderful thoughts. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts real quick? Um, we'll plan to continue next Thursday, picking up with verse 19 of John chapter 3. Any other final thoughts? Really? Okay. <laughs> Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for joining us for our study today. If you have any other thoughts that maybe come to mind later, you can send them to us. Oh, wrong button. There we go. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Or if you really have a personal thought that you want to send to any of us individually, send it to um, like me, John at truthfactor.com, Paul at Tom at Brian at Brian, and then even Bob at truthfactor.com. Let Bob know what you have to think about these things. Well, thank you so much. And we will be back here again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time for another Factoring the Truth of God's Word into our lives and your life as well, continuing John chapter 3, verse 19. Have a wonderful week.